Okay. I am going live. So as people join, I will try to monitor our chat. If there is any okay. chat in the Facebook comments on my phone here. Um, yeah, usually feel, what I like, yeah. Feel free to interrupt me and uh, ask a question. Uh, I might if if it seems appropriate. Uh, um, you know, or we or or we can wait till the end. I don't mind being interrupted. So that well, maybe, makes maybe it a I bit more. Yeah. I mean, as I interrupt you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, that will be that 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 will be just fine to uh, kind of address. You know, use your judgment because if because uh, you know if if it becomes all interruptions rather than a talk, then it's harder to, uh, to, to to get anywhere. It is tough. I can tell you, it's tougher in live streams because people tune in and tune out so quickly. It's it's harder um, or it's easier when you're in a, a room where people just kind of don't get up and walk out. 10 minutes they're captive. To talk. Yeah, yeah. They're captive. so they stay until the end anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so um, Mike, Dr. Shaw, um, I'd like to do a little introduction for you so people that are tuning in know who you are. Um, Dr. Shaw is on the faculty at SAUE. SAUE is very lucky to have him. Our community is very lucky to have him. I'm lucky to have him talking to me here. Uh, originally from Eastern Townships of Quebec, Mike Shaw earned a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry at Mount Allison University in 1988. He worked with Peter... Dr. Peter Legstons at the University of British Columbia and earned a PhD in inorganic chemistry in 1993. He and his partner then moved to the University of Vermont where Dr. Shaw was a postdoctoral fellow in Dr. William Geiger's group and where he developed a taste for electroanalytical chemistry. In 1996, Dr. Shaw began lecturing at the University of Vermont and taught classes in labs in freshman chemistry, chemistry for allied health sciences, quantitative analysis, and advanced inorganic chemistry. These experiences shaped the rest of his career. Now in 1998, Dr. Shaw accepted an assistant professor, professor position in inorganic chemistry at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville. So he and his partner moved here to Edwardsville. Uh, he was granted tenure and promotion in 2003. He was prom promoted again to full professor in 2008. He served as chair of his department from 2012 to 2015 and was awarded the title Distinguished research professor in 2017. He has made a point in his career to create opportunities for undergraduate and MS students to participate in externally funded research uh, experiences. Most recently, his work has focused on the synthesis of biological relevant metal containing molecules with an emphasis on the consequences of electron transfer and their structure and reactivity. Uh, he and his partner recently celebrated 30 years of being together. So thank you, Dr. Shaw. And I, I will say, that I originally had you scheduled to do this talk. I think last April, you were going to give a talk on nuclear medicine. And then the next month, this um, uh, some chemistry behind the colors we see, pigments, colors and dyes, oh my. Um, and this summer of 2021, it is the Illinois I Reads Summer Reading Program's theme. So every summer we have a big theme for the summer reading program. This year is Reading Colors Your World. And I think by delaying this thing by uh, 14 months or however long it's been, uh, we've got a pretty perfect thematic timing here. So uh, thank you for coming and on and doing this talk for me and I'll turn it over to you. Uh, and you should be able to screen share. All righty, well, I'll, I'll screen share in a second. I wanna thank you, Jacob, for, your, for, for the invitation. Um, um, lecturing at the public library is uh, something that I've uh, wanted to do for a little while now, uh, and uh, just having the opportunity is 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 a wonderful thing. Uh, so, um, with that, I will start my talk, and I'm going to show you a jar of something. I'm going to move it away from my coffee first because, well. It is chemical. We're here in my office at SIUE. Uh, um, welcome. It's been a little while since I've done anything from my office. This is a thing called potassium ferric cyanide. It is uh, maybe one of the components that you'd find when you're making Prussian blue. I just love it because it's big, dark orange crystals. I think if I hold that up to the camera, you can see like big, dark orange crystals. If you take some of this, some of these crystals and grind them up in a mortar and pestle, you get that color, right? So the colors that we perceive aren't always 
the inherent color of a substance themselves, they also have to do with uh, the size of the particles and how light hits them and how light moves through them and how light scatters off of them. So today I was going to talk a little bit about those processes and uh, you know show you some uh, different dyes and pigments. Oh my! Uh, and you know basically uh, basically have a little adventure with you. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see, uh, share screen one, share. And here we are. It's my usual opening slide warning. It, it may contain chemistry and, and cats. You're going to see plenty of my cats today. Um, it, it, you are watching this over the internet. So uh, our cat overlords do need to have their share of attention. Um, the real title of my talk here, Pigments and Colors and Dyes, oh my, uh, and uh, it's some of the chemistry behind the colors we see. Uh, a lot of the photos here I took myself. Uh, these are uh, would have been all photos uh, from uh, either at the garden here in Edwardsville or, in the, or at the Missouri Botanical Garden. So humans like art. We've been drawing and making things for a very long time now. Um, so um, an example I can show you is this one. This is a bison. Um, it's drawn in red ochre. Red ochre is a naturally occurring substance. It's a rock, Fe2O3. And for those of you who are uh, chemically minded, Fe2O3 is rust. Uh, just like what happens on my car uh, if I leave it out in, um, leave it out in the elements uh, too much. Um, one of the things you'll notice on my talk, I am an academic, I do try to make sure that um, um, I um, attribute uh, each image and each resource that um, I use. Um, and um, Jacob, um, I can make a PDF of this available to you afterwards if you want to have that on your site. Yeah, we would take that or even a I guess PDF would be more easily accessible than a, right. a PowerPoint to people because some people might not have PowerPoint. Uh, but yeah, I could post that both on the, the um, a link in the comments and in our uh, YouTube if we post that later. So, That'd yes. be awesome. Yeah, so I'll make that available so that uh, people can access all these links that I have and uh, follow up on things that are of interest to them. Well, um, this particular example is... 18 and a half thousand years old, right? And uh, it's, it's, it's a beautiful example of what, what people, people uh, can do with colors. And I will say that back 18,000 years ago, I think our palette was a bit more limited than uh, what we have available to us now. Uh, a little bit of history, uh, you know, one of, the, one, of, one of the great advances, I think, in human uh, uh, development. Um, fire, of course, the fire made possible pottery. Uh, this is a black figure vase. It's uh, from about, it's Greek from about uh, uh, 300 to 400 uh, BC. Uh, and the real technical um, achievement here is to get the different colors just from firing the clay. Um, there isn't really paint used here. Uh, or pigments or anything. It's all the same clay. Um, essentially what they did was made a clay uh, pot on, and they um, used a slip. Now a slip is uh, you take uh, the clay or dilute it down and you can kind of paint with it. Um, and you know then you can scratch little bits of this slip out. And then you take your clay and you fire it at uh, oh, about 800 degrees. It turns the whole pot red. There's no detail. You don't can't see anything on, on this. Um, but you have fired the pot, so it will stay together. Then you heat it up further. Use some green wood. That's going to uh, and kind of tamp down the oxygen a bit. That's going to make carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide. Uh, will react with our rust, will react with our um, Fe2O3. Uh, let me do a thing where I get my um, laser pointer. There we go. Our, we get our um, Fe2O3 reacting with carbon monoxide. That makes magnetite. Magnetite is a black mineral and um, 
know, it's, we would, as a chemist, I'd say it's a little more reduced than um, hematite, the, uh, the uh, iron oxide form that we're used to. Um, the other thing that happens at 950 is that that slip that we started with turns into a impermeable glass. So anything under that slip is going to stay the black color. And as you cool down and let air in, everything else on the pot turns back to red. So um, th this is this is a magnificent way of uh, figuring out, uh, or this this figuring out how this happened or how how this could be done was uh, a magnificent advance. This was real craft secrets here. Um, and again, uh, I have links to where these objects can be found in the British Museum. I've used the uh, museum, British Museum, a lot for, for these things. Uh, there were other advances. Let's see, can I get to my next slide now? Yes, there we go. Um, so for example, here's another um, uh, Greek pot. This one has red figures on a black background. Uh, it's slightly technically different. Uh, it's a bit more advanced uh, uh, technique. Um, notice that this date is a little bit earlier than the previous one. Uh, so they were still using the same um, um, techniques um, you know, during uh, dif different time periods. Um, but the black and the um, the black and the red are simply different forms of iron oxides that uh, the craftsmen uh, were able to uh, bring out by manipulating how they fired these things. So brings me to to a point like uh, in my title, I'm talking about pigments and dyes. Well, what are, what's the difference? Well, um, how, how the thing dissolves makes it a different. Um, you know, a pigment tends not to be something that dissolves uh, very much, right? You know, pigment's gonna be a solid that you can disperse and then attach to something in general. Uh, a dye is gonna be something that you can dissolve and then you have to anchor it somehow chemically to the object that you want um, to use, uh, have colored, right? So there's additives, uh, some um, fabrics, for example, like cotton um, have exact, like sugar molecules essentially um, throughout their structure. And some of the sugar molecules can grab onto dyes and um, hold them pretty uh, strongly. Otherwise, you might use something called a mordant, which might be an inorganic chemical that attaches to the sugar molecules and then attaches to your dyes, right? But main difference between pigment and dye is um, how, how they dissolve. So picture I took at the uh, St. Louis Art Museum in 2003, they, there was a nice little exhibit uh, at that time on um, stained glass. And uh, they, on, at the side, they just had this, um, they just had this exhibit of different um, uh, pigments and dyes that uh, just caught my eye. So for example, uh, yellow ochre down here, this would have been what the uh, cave art was uh, drawn with, uh, brown ochre, so slightly different uh, compositions. Um, let's see, um, madder, cochineal carmine, and uh, indigo, uh, more modern um, dyes. Uh, gum arabic is something that uh, is often used as a mordant to fix a dye to, to a fabric. So those are examples of, uh, of different uh, uh, dyes and uh, pigments. Sometimes during the talk, I'm going to show you something orange from my lab because my, my, everything in my lab tends to be orange. Uh, so uh, this is a ruthenium-based compound, uh, and it just kind of crystallized out from the flask. Um, so um, speed bumps are um, just, just that, just to slow me down a little bit. So. pigments, dyes, colors that we see. Um, there, there's a lot of things that influence like how we perceive color. 
Uh, maybe starting off with uh, just the light itself coming off an object. Um, light is just one form of electromagnetic radiation, right? Um, don't be scared of the word radiation. It's uh, basically just uh, just a just a word that uh, talks about uh, photons, uh, packets of energy that uh, come out of um, you know uh, physical processes. Uh, most electromagnetic radiation is harmless. Um, most electromagnetic radiation um, is, is very low energy. If you don't have a lot of energy as a photon, you can't really do anything bad to a molecule. Uh, so um, maybe I should talk about uh, um, the different forms here. Visible light is what you're used to. So um, Roy G. Biv, that little bit, down here, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's uh, what Roy G. Biv uh, stands for. It's a very small section of the electromagnetic radiation spectrum. But what you see is just a small section. There is no other real qualitative difference between you know, uh, light at different ends. Just a wavelength. You can see light from about 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers. So what's a nanometer? Well, a meter is 39 inches. So if you take a meter, 39 inches, and divide it into a billion, right? So one billionth of 39 inches is a nanometer, right? So very, very tiny. So 400 nanometers would be 400 times a billionth of eh, about a yard, right? You can see from 400 to 800. There's all sorts of other wavelengths. There's infrared, that's heat uh, radiation. You can feel that like with, with your skin. Microwave radiation, like exactly what it sounds like. It's in, it occurs naturally inside the box in your kitchen that you put your coffee in in the morning. Um, radio waves, uh, just again, what you tune into. Um, these guys tend not to be particularly high energy. It's when you get into ultraviolet X-ray and gamma rays that you have to be uh, careful because ultraviolet X-ray and gamma rays actually have enough energy to can start knocking electrons off of molecules. And if that happens in you, then uh, that can cause uh, unwanted chemistry to happen. So here's just some sizes of things that are comparable. Atomic nuclei are the size of gamma rays, um, something that's like half a mile, kilometer or so, um, might be uh, on the order of uh, radio waves and all the points in between, right? Protozoans, single cells are about the size of the wavelength of light that you can see. Let's see. I think I've got some slides that actually duplicate this stuff. Yeah, so what we see is down in uh, this region. Note it's a logarithmic scale. Click. Um, and again, uh, this is uh, another form of the same uh, picture. Click. So um, we can, what we see, what we uh, perceive is photons, uh, particles of light, um, of different uh, wavelengths hitting our eye. And, you know, fundamentally, the wavelength will determine color, right? But here's the thing. Uh, if I go back one slide, this is our spectrum that we can see. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. It's the, all the colors of the rainbow, but I don't see pink or brown right? There's colors that are constructed in your brain. So there is the physics of light that um, gives us uh, colors, but there's also some psychology. Uh, the, some of the colors you see are constructed within your brain, right? Um, and this is a nice little picture of a brain. Here's, here's an eye. Um, the lens of your eye will um, focus light on uh, your retina. There's cells in your retina that react to light and send out signals to the uh, visual centers of the brain that do processing and kind of bring the various signals 
together into a perception of a color that physically might not be there. There is no brown in the rainbow. There is no pink in the rainbow, right? There's, there, there's just Roji Biv. Chris. And uh, this always blows me away. So if you look at an eye, your retina, um, the light that comes from outside, right? The lens makes a image on the retina. Um, the light comes from the top of this part of the diagram and it has to travel through all the nerve cells to get to the rods and cones, which are the sensory cells, right? And um, the most people would have uh, rods which are sensitive to light and give you essentially black and white vision. Um, uh, most people have uh, three different types of cones. Um, there's um, also um, people who are colorblind. My partner's colorblind. So he has the red green colorblindness. It um, uh, makes it difficult for, for him sometimes to uh, see uh, subtle differences in, in some shades. Um, but uh, you know, most, most people have uh, three different types of cones each, sep each sensitive to a slightly different set of wavelengths of light. Right? And all the information from all of these uh, cones um, comes, um, is gathered by these um, neurons, these cells, and uh, transmitted down the optic nerve to uh, the visual centers of the brain. Now your brain does a lot of other things too, right? Uh, this is one of my favorite things. Uh, you can do try this at home. Um, if you don't read the words, name the colors, okay? So I'm gonna go green, pink, blue, red, yellow, red, blue. I find this very difficult because that first one, when I said green, it's shrieking in my head, red. Right, because reading is so ingrained in us, right? So um, <laughs> this could be a very disturbing thing to do to uh, students during a class, but it's also a nice little exercise that kind of shows you like your brain processing happens um, at a level below your consciousness. You see all these colors, um, but there's also other things going on. So I mentioned uh, rods and cones. Um, there's uh, three ty different types of rods in um, many people, uh, and they're, they're sensitive to a little bit, slightly different sets of wavelengths. I'm showing you a graph here. On the x-axis here, this is uh, the wavelength, 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometers. These are the colors of light um, that each wavelength um, corresponds to. And you have rods in your eye that kind of are more sensitive to these short wavelengths, maybe about maximum 450. And then you've got a pair of rods or a set, set of rods that has maximum at about, I don't know, 540. And then another maximum, maybe about 580, right? These are very similar to each other, uh, but they're just different enough so that um, your brain can put together the information to perceive all of these colors and more besides, all right? Yeah, so some attributions, yes, because uh, I'm not a psychologist, I have to make sure that I attribute. And I hope you don't mind if I have a bit of a coffee, I can show you an orange speed bump during my coffee. So orange things, the tree outside my house. This is Seth, he's orange. Um, this is one of the compounds we made in my lab in 2015. It's a beautiful orange, um, these daisies, um, cone flowers, I think they are um, in my yard, beautiful. And this is something a student showed me. They had crystallized out uh, some, some ferrocene in one of the teaching labs, um, orange. So, speed bump. 
how, how can we get color? Well, um, we do have to we do have to show different um, different um, sets of wavelengths coming into the eye. There has to be some way of uh, choosing those, right? And that's where we get into our dyes and pigments and some physical techniques that are really interesting as well. Um, the dispersion, I'll show you a prism uh, diffraction grading uh, in, in a second. Scattering, you're a bit familiar with already. Why is the sky blue except at sunset? Well, the sky is blue because light from the sun gets scattered off of particles of dust and uh, the like. And we see um, the blue light scattered. Um, at sunset or sunrise, the light's going through a thicker layer of atmosphere. So uh, there's more scattering. So the longer wavelengths of light start to get scattered more and we see uh, red. Um, that's actually very important for a lot of uh, tech, or for a lot of issues like the one I showed you right at the beginning. How does light scatter? That uh, will uh, change the color of a substance. There's, a, there's interference patterns. Uh, so when you look at an oil slick, like a um, you know a puddle with a little bit of oil on it on the road, you can see colors. Um, um, in fact. Um, it's related to why you see rainbows uh, after it rains. Um, there's a lovely little video of um, interference um, by uh, Paul Doherty. He passed away a few years ago, but um, it was from the San Francisco Exploratorium. This link is really worth seeing. It's not that uh, long a video, and there's an explanation um, of, um, the, of, of those colors as well. Absorption. That's a property of substances, and, and that's something I'm going to talk about in a, a little bit of detail. Um, okay, so starting with uh, dispersion, um, this is like the Pink Floyd album, um, the dark side of the moon. Essentially, light can be split up into its component colors because uh, different wavelengths of light um, uh, get bent uh, differently um, when you put them through a prism and then they can uh, spread out into um, uh, the, the spectrum, the Roy G. Biv. Um, I'm going to show you a butterfly wing, which can do this sort of thing as well, um, and some examples of colloidal solutions. In fact, colloidal solutions, what are colloidal? What are colloids? Um, Mayonnaise, I guess, is a colloid. Uh, think of anything that has a very fine dispersion of particles, like in a liquid. Um, mayonnaise would be a would be an example. What I've got here is the Lycurgus cup. Uh, this is in the British Museum. Um, this is glass, but it's got um, tiny particles of gold and silver. Um, dispersed through it. It's actually nanoparticles. If they did this deliberately, it would be nanotechnology, um, but they didn't do it deliberately. Um, the tiny particles in the Lycurgus cup can scatter light. When you're looking at reflected light, um, the light essentially bounces off, doesn't penetrate the um, glass very far, and the color of light that is uh, scattered back to you is more in the greenish end. The transmitted light, when you have a light source behind the cup, and this is the identical cup, um, it's a white light source behind the cup, and you get more scattering, and so you see um, more of uh, red light getting through. Right. This, is exact, this is exactly the same thing as why we see a uh, red um, sky around sunrise and uh, sunset. Um, so the Lycurgus cup is actually uh, famous for this particular uh, property. Um, and uh, Lycurgus is a figure from uh, Greek mythology. Uh, you can see him here. Uh, his ultimate fate, I think, was um, to uh, be like I don't know, killed by uh, snakes. So we can we we can see him being killed by snakes here. I wouldn't drink from this cup. Um, 
it's also in the British Museum. So if I tried, I think I'd be arrested. Yeah. Another mechanism. I talked about interference a little bit. This is the oil slick um, model. Um, you can have light bouncing off different layers and the thickness of the layer will influence how light um, bounces off. Um, and we'll have some light traveling a different distance, right? And as we know, our light is made of waves. So we have light waves coming in and we have light waves coming out. And if whatever it's reflecting off of has different layers to it, some light can penetrate to the next layer and bounce off. But what that means is that uh, maybe the light coming from the first layer and the light reflected off the second layer travel a different distance. It might mean that these peaks and valleys don't line up anymore, right? So it could be that they line up perfectly and then we see more intense light. It could be that they um, line up so as to destroy each other with a peak and a trough um, uh, overlapping, which basically gives you no light intensity. And you get all the possibilities in between for all the different wavelengths. The upshot is like, depending on the angle you look at, like a very thin oil slick on a puddle, um, you're going to see different colors as um, different combinations of light undergo this constructive and destructive interference, right? Particles can make this happen as well. So um, here's, a, uh, here's a biological example. We have a uh, butterfly here. So there is no pigment or dye in this butterfly. Um, what you see here, all these colors, uh, just come from the physical structures that, uh, of, of the butterfly's wing. So if we keep zooming in um, with first a microscope and then an electron microscope, you can see um, that's, it's probably more of a moth, isn't it? We can see the wing. Um, and we can see the colors in the wing. And as we zoom in, well, we still see some colors in the wing, but then we start zooming in on individual flakes with the uh, electron microscope. And we can see as we get more and more magnification, just the structures that are happening here. Light is going to reflect off of these structures um, with a dependence on the wavelength of light. So like something that's 400 nanometers long is gonna reflect off a little different than something that's 500 nanometers long, right? Those two wavelengths. And you'll get the diffraction and the interference. And essentially that interference pattern gets you these wonderful colors. So there's no dyes here, it's all physical. Let's see. I've got two screens, so uh, getting my mouse to where I can click on go uh, for the next uh, for the for, for the next slide is always a challenge. Here's a speed bump. I'm going to grab a sip of my coffee. Let's see. These are crystals of yellow stuff that uh, we make in my lab. Uh, this is when we isolated them, they became nice little flakes. Um, we make purple stuff as well. This is another um, ruthenium compound. I use a lot of ruthenium in my lab. And uh, here's a cat that's, uh, his name was Sin. Um, um, we had Sin for nine years. He passed away recently. Um, he, as, as with all cats, he lo loved to sit in uh, boxes. Okay, so I've talked a little bit about physical processes that get you white light split up into colors and you can have dispersion and interference and refraction, um, but there's also um, what pigments and dyes actually do. So they are molecules, pigments and dyes are. So let's talk about the simplest molecule, um, hydrogen. Hydrogen 
if you think of a hydrogen atom, there is, there's a nucleus. It's got a proton in it, plus charge. Um, it's got an electron somewhere around it. Electron is about, um, or the proton's about 2,000 times the mass of the electron. So proton kind of moves around fairly slowly, and the electron is everywhere. Um, and, you know, when you're talking atomic scale and uh, the scale of electrons, then quantum effects come into play. Um, you can kind of think of the electron as being a wave, as having wave-like properties. So, yeah, going back here, properties of waves include this interference stuff, right? So if, you, if you've got two electrons, they could constructively interfere right? Or they could destructively interfere. Okay. So if you're actually a physicist and you're listening to this, please do not hate me. Uh, I'm, I'm really um, trying to make this the simplest explanation I can. So each of these hydrogen atoms that's going to make up an H2 has an electron. And as you bring the two atoms closer and closer together, the wave properties of those electrons, they, those electrons start to talk to each other. And there's two ways for interference to happen. You can have the constructive, so that you add the ability of the electron to electrons to exist in a particular place. You, you add those probabilities together, or you subtract them. So if you add them together, you basically get a space where both of those electrons can roam. If you subtract them, then you get an area where the electrons can be. You get area where they would otherwise overlap. And it's like, yeah, no, that's no man's land. There's, there's some sort of treaty. Um, and then there is another, another lobe here. Um, think of it this way. We got a plus charge and a plus charge. And at least a lot of the time, you could have at least one, maybe both minus charges in between. Plus, minus, plus, opposites attract. That's going to keep a molecule together. And hey, there's only two electrons, uh, and they could both fit in this particular, we'll call it an orbital. Um, so, I mean, basically, this is a model of the bonding and keeping two hydrogens together. This thing still, this thing still exists potentially, though, because this is an allowed energy that electrons in this configuration with two protons around um, could exist at. Right? Any other energy in between is not um, allowed. So here's the thing: um, light is energy. And an H2 molecule can absorb um, light. It stashes it in an electron. And it could cause that electron to move out of this configuration into this configuration. I, I should mention, physically, these occupy the same space. Um, I've just kind of moved one up to indicate it's a higher energy. This is a fun, this is fundamental for understanding how um, uh, how molecules influence, like what colors you see. Um, the absorption of light is basically um, is basically moving electrons from um, one place to another in a molecule. Okay, so H2. Uh, 111 nanometers, that's in the hard UV. You can't see that. That's uh, way shorter than what you can see. But we have molecules that you can, you can start seeing. Um, I'm not going to scare you with this stuff. This is a great slide for my students. Um, I'll just kind of mention, though, if you have like carbon molecules and they have this pattern of double bonds and single bonds and double bonds alternating, um, you start to get more and more allowed energy levels closer together, okay? Uh, let's see. 
And a great example of that is this guy. So this is beta carotene, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. We call it conjugation as if you're a chemist. And you can see that um, it's basically conjugated all the way along here. What it means is that the wavelength that the electrons in whatever orbitals this thing has would be a fairly long wavelength for its absorption. Um, it would absorb, um, well, it would absorb um, kind of the blue end of light hitting it, leaving us seeing orange. Okay, that's one thing that I should should talk about a little bit too. Um, you know, when you have a molecule or have a substance, um, light hits it, and some lights gets absorbed, some lights gets um, reflected. You don't see the absorbed light; it stays in the substance, warming it up or something. Um, what you see is what's reflected, right? So um, your carrots do not absorb orange light at all. Um, the carrots are absorbing everything but the orange light, right? Uh, beta carotene is um, helping that to happen. So, yeah, if I were uh, talking in one of my classes, I could basically say, hey, these are the various types of bonds that you, um, are possible. And, you know, these are the various types of transitions. And then I could talk a little bit about um, whether some of these are allowed or not. This is just um, colors for organic compounds. We'll talk maybe a bit later about uh, inorganic compounds. And there's that. Um, we can study color. Uh, this uh, cartoon, this cartoon represents a uh, spectrometer. A uh, spectrometer is going to have a light source. It's going to have some way of controlling the light source. If, if it were one of my classes, I'd say, OK, we're going to have a small diameter aperture. We're going to have a shutter. Um, we're always going to compare some sample to some blank. Well, what does that mean? Well, this looks like a test tube. It could just be a test tube, test tube full of clean, like pure water versus a test tube of, I don't know, maybe some food dye or something like that dissolved in some water. We'd have to do the comparison to get rid of all the instrumental, um, all the instrumental um, effects. So our light's coming from the source through some sort of hole going through our sample. We've got some way like a prism or a grating, some way of dispersing the light. And then we are going to detect um, all of the light, all of the different colors that come out and kind of quantify them. Um, while these look like weird, creepy eyes, it could be as simple as, um, it could be as simple as the um, um, diffraction grating or the uh, diode array, um, um, detector, like in your cell phone or something. And then we use uh, the computer, um, basically uh, take the ratio at each wavelength of the power coming through our sample, the power coming through our blank, take the logarithm of it, plot it. This is, uh, this is for motion optics. This is a what one of those spectrometers looks like today. It actually literally fits in the palm of your hand. Um, very, very nice. Uh, technology. Again, we have an orange solution, right? So and it's almost a drinking game with me now because uh, uh, every time I see something orange, I have to have a sip of coffee. So uh, technically, that's a description of how we get things called spectra. Uh, these are um, these are actual spectra. What we see on the x-axis here, it's slightly different x-axis, but this is pretty much going to be, um, there's going to be a relationship to wavelength. They're actually just showing a frequency here. Um, the y-axis um, is absorbance, essentially. So um, when you're down at zero, it means like all the light's getting through. 
And as you go up more, it means less and less light is coming through. So for these nickel compounds, what we can see is uh, like three bands. And that's going to tell us something about the electronic structure of the molecule, right? We, we don't need, need to worry about electronic structures for, for, for today, but um, this would be an analytical way of describing uh, what the colors are, um, you know, scientifically. So um, here's, here, here's, uh, here, here's, here's a set of uh, blue things. I, I like some, I like blue as well. We'll, we'll look at some blue solution or blue um, things later on. This is just copper. And uh, one of the experiments that um, I teach at, uh, in our labs, uh, we make different copper uh, solutions. Um, the copper that's got six waters attached, I haven't shown that. It's barely blue. You can't see it at all. But then we can just add little bits uh, or more and more ammonia to a solution. And you can kind of start seeing some qualitative changes. Um, you know, basically, uh, the experiment I described on the previous slide that gets you that kind of graph, um, we can do the same thing to, to, to this and uh, you know, get some information out that, uh, yeah, I forced my student to explain why, um, you know, why the colors get uh, darker and quantitatively different in the wavelength uh, maximum. Uh, these are my cats. Uh, well, not all of them are alive. These are the cats I've had over the last 30 years. Um, and I'm missing one, uh, our, my youngest one. So, But uh, it's a pun, cation. It's a cation. And the ion that has a positive charge is called a cation. Yeah, I should stick to my day job. Here's a speed bump. I took all these photographs, uh, uh, dragonflies in my yard. I guess that's a B. If we're being technical about it, I should make sure that I use the right words, right? Dragonflies versus bees. Um, I did mention blue. We, copper is um, lovely to make blue compounds. Uh, copper also makes green compounds. If you look at the Statue of Liberty, it's covered with copper oxide. Um, Blue, it has been for art uh, very difficult to um, to produce. Um, you know, blue has been very very prized over um, historically. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some some different blues. I realize that you're looking at these blue colors on a monitor and. Uh, what you see in the monitor may not be exactly the color of the um, uh, dye or pigments that uh, we're talking about, right? So Egyptian blue, Prussian blue, cerulean, um, you know, I do hope that you can see um, qualitative difference between uh, the various blues here. So, so I'm going to show you, um, and anyway, I used... Um, I used uh, Wikipedia's RGB values um, to, uh, you know, see or to, to construct these uh, in my talk. So they should look relatively um, uh, close to, to, to what you expect. So um, Egyptian blue uh, is basically a copper-based blue. Um, again, uh, it's the first synthetic pigment, so it's worth mentioning. Um, we have, um, we have, um, you know, these uh, figures uh, from uh, Egyptian tombs, uh, Shabti. Um, these were the guys who in the afterlife would be doing the work for you if you were called on by the gods to plow the fields or uh, pick, uh, pick plants or something. Your Shabti would come to life and do uh, that work for you. Um, you know, they, the blue on here is essentially related to glass making type, type of blue. Um, you can see that uh, calcium, copper, silicate is the, um, is the uh, blue that would um, 
be, be found here. And for a long time, uh, we didn't have the recipe. Uh, recently, the recipe has been uh, rediscovered. Uh, this particular object comes from the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in um, New York. All right, so quick tour of some more blues. Um, you might recognize this one, uh, Starry Night by Van Gogh, very famous. It actually has two types of blue in it. There's a Prussian blue, uh, which is this darker blue, and the cerulean, which is the cobalt tin type uh, blue, much, much brighter. Um, I can show you a structure uh, model of that uh, some other time. Um, Prussian blue is lovely. Uh, it's basically, um, you know, what this, this bottle of stuff that I showed you at the beginning um, um, would be an ingredient. Um, this is the name of this bottle, potassium ferric cyanide. It's got six cyanides for each iron. But despite that, Prussian blue, which still has a lot of cyanide in it, it's pretty non-toxic. Uh, the, the iron uh, binds the cyanide so that it really can't escape. Um, much, uh, much more toxic would be the cerulean, the cobalt-2 uh, tin, tin oxide type of uh, um, color. But you can see the two blues are very different from each other. And, uh, just, um, you know, it is necessary to have the two different hues of blue to be able to, uh, for Van Gogh to have been able to produce this um, painting, this masterpiece. Um, so Prussian blue, I love the structure. This is some sciencey stuff for you. Um, Prussian blue, the irons are basically at the vertices of this kind of cubic structure and the tubes connecting the irons are CN bonds. And we have irons that are attached to six carbons. We've got other irons adjacent that are attached to six nitrogens. Inside the tubes, and here in my uh, structure model, I deleted those, but you can see them. Inside each of these little cubes is a water molecule. So it is a three-dimensional uh, structure um, that gives us uh, uh, Prussian blue. Uh, there are so many Prussian blue type structures. You can mix and match the different metals in here, like the iron three plus, the iron two plus, you can mix and match um, the cyanide, swap them out for other things. Um, I've seen a cobalt platinum version of this that strangely enough is blue. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have expected that, um, but it has all this kind of uh, same structure um, going on. Um, it's another blue, uh, cobalt blue, it's a cobalt, illuminate. So cobalt with aluminum and oxygen. You know, these cobalt uh, compounds tend to be kind of toxic. So uh, a search for um, blues that uh, don't kill the artists are, um, are, are lovely. All right, I'm going to wrap up after my blue section. There's a crystal structure of um, the uh, of the cobalt blue here. Uh, some people can see this structure. If you kind of look at it right and then cross your eyes and overlay the images, you can, some people can uh, see this in three dimensions. I can, but I should stop trying because I realize that I'm being recorded just say, looking at the screen with crossed eyes, uh, which is kind of like weird. Um, Indigo, one of the fam famous, famous um, dyes. It's a, um, this is a, um, this is a kimono um, um, resist dyed with indigo. Uh, just the process of um, tying um, the fabric so that when you dunk the whole thing into an indigo vat, parts of it stay dry and parts of it absorb the indigo. And then you pull it out and let it all dry off. Um, you know, just the just the, the technical prowess that goes into making uh, something like this is just incredible. Uh, so this was made in Japan in 1820. Uh, um, and essentially, you know, all of these 
details you see um, were um, essentially tied into the fabric before it went into the dyeing vat. Indigo, um, a naturally occurring dye, but it's made synthetically today. Uh, it's not very efficient to uh, make indigo, um, you know, by uh, farming it from, from plants anymore. There's a couple of different forms of indigo. This is the blue form. It's not soluble. Um, so getting it into your fabric, you have your dye and you essentially have, uh, have it uh, at a high pH, um, lots of electrons around, you have it in this form, that dissolves. And then you dump your fabric into the vat, pull the fabric out, it's wet with this solution of this form of indigo. And as you leave it out to dry, oxygen in the air takes some of those electrons away, takes the solubility away and gives you the blue color. This is the blue color of your blue jeans. So there's chemistry here. Um, requires uh, uh, control of pH and control of electrons. Um, there's all sorts of different ways that people have done um, controlling indigo. And as we uh, kind of wrap, wrap things up with, with this blue period, um, Yen Min, um, new pigment discovered in 2009. It was like the first new blue in uh, 200 years. Uh, apparently this is non-toxic, although it's got yttrium, indium, and manganese, all of which could be considered heavy metals. Um, and uh, it has this really gorgeous blue uh, color. It has been uh, commercialized. It's close to cobalt blue, uh, so uh, you would expect it to be um, able to be used for many of the same material, for some, many of the same applications. Now, some of these things, indigo is very organic. You couldn't use indigo to, uh, you know, make the blue on a ceramic or anything like that. Um, this thing, uh, a metal oxide, that should survive the firing process and be more appropriate for a ceramic. Okay. I always over prepare. I got a bunch of slides. There's the crystal structure of uh, the the yin min. Uh, kind of got layers going on uh, of the different um, uh, metals and um, oxygens. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to uh, wrap up. I've got stuff I can talk about for a future talk if uh, people are interested in. Um, but I kind of wanted to um, wrap up with a big thank you, uh, more cats, uh, some orange ones as well. I'll have to have some coffee. Uh, definitely want to thank um, the audience today, the Edwardsville Public Library. Uh, always thanking my um, colleagues and students here at uh, SIUE uh, um, and uh, the support of National Science Foundation for our work on uh, our um, metal nitrosyl compounds. Um, some of you know some of that work I showed you today as well. Um, and, you know, uh, my partner's website for hosting some of the animated GIFs that uh, you'll be able to get to see in the um, um, PDF version of this. And uh, obviously, my cats for their patience, I take, I take pictures of, of them, uh, of, of them uh, way too often. All righty. And then finally, just some attributions and direct links and uh, thank yous and stuff. So, so Jacob. You survived. Yeah. You survived. <laughs> oh, well yeah, done. Taking notes. No, this has been great. Um, we've had a, a number of people popping in and watching. Um, I don't have any questions from the audience, but if, if you entertain some of my, my hard hitting questions, I can ask some, and maybe someone else will get some courage to ask one that's that, that are still to. watching. I'd um, love to. So, um, you might not have heard this. I'm hoping you have. Um, so the the I don't know if it's a color pigment, Vanta black, the black paint that seems to be very controversial in the fact that it's, you know, owned or developed for some artists that kind of has um, control over who gets to use it. But this color is just so, um, it's like looking at some kind of computer uh, game error or something. It, 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 it looks like you're staring into like a, 
a void in space that's been missing from the matrix. So what are the absorptive properties of that? Why am I looking at that thing and it doesn't even look like a physical object in the world? It's, so it's, it's a very greedy substance. Every photon that hits it pretty much is kept. It's like, I'll take this photon, I'll take this photon. Um, there's nothing being reflected or scattered back to your eye um, for your eye to be able to register that there's an object there if it's painted with this um, the phantom black, right? So essentially, um, you know, it, it's, it, if I were to predict what its UV vis spectrum would look like, and I'm gonna show you the annotate function here. All right, so here's a graph. It's got a Y axis and an X axis. And we're gonna have our wavelength on this axis and we're gonna have absorbance over here. So the more absorbance, the less light gets through. So over here, down here, if it's zero absorbance, all the light's getting through. And then the higher the number is on uh, that direction, the less light's getting through. We're essentially got that going on up here at infinity for the uh, for the Vanta Black. There's just there's just no little dip that you might see for another compound um, that would let your um, you know that that would let your light eye know that there's uh, some some figure there. So for that property to exist is i mean does it pretty much have to be black to have that kind of void of color would you could you see like a purple that could just like not absorb any light could could any other color for lack of a better term have that effect with light where you look like you're looking at something that's not even real i think i think not i think that i mean so so this is a psychological effect that i may be um getting wrong but I think um, I think for this um, feeling of staring into the void, um, you'd have to have no photons coming back into your eye, right? Because um, you know you can look at a like a big screen and have it all the same color, and it's not the same experience, right? Um, you know, if you look at a flat screen TV and you hook up your computer and you kind of look at, uh, let's clear all of those, clear all of my drawings. Um, you know, say, say if we um, hit these RGB colors. Oh, hey. So, yeah, so say in this color pattern here, this is basically um, a representation of every color your eye can see, essentially. Um, you know, any point along here, if you kind of looked at it, a solid big screen TV of it, there's still light coming into your eyes. You are still getting some sensory input. Um, I think that with uh, the Phantom Black, that um, you're getting no input into your eyes. Um, so you're still going to have some neural, random neural uh, processing going on that should be very disturbing, um, right? Just what is your base? It's, what is your baseline level of neural processing in your visual cortex when no um, uh, when no lights coming in? Um, and if I'm if I'm really going to speculate, I say, okay, well, that's kind of like what you see when you've got your eyes shut and you're dreaming, right? Yeah, yeah. If I, well, I don't know how long it's been around, but every time I see it, it's just really kind of mind blowing. It, 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 you make, yeah, even looking at it through a computer screen, which is the only way I could think I would see that. I, some artist used his some sculpture at Coachella. So if you happen to be at Coachella, you could see it in real life. Um, but you were talking about blue um, in the beginning of your blue period. Mm -hmm. um, so something about blue being hard to replicate or hard to create. I was just thinking when you were saying that, it's it's also been very hard to create and replicate in a um, just a, a, a visual projection and visual, um, you know, it, for, for LED screens, but also going back to um, just rear projection television and stuff, you always had the, the red, the green, the blue, 
guns or the CRT tubes. And it was always the like the most expensive TVs that could say like, oh, we have the most accurate blue. Like Pioneer Elite was the, was the one brand of TV. It was like this three thousand dollar, or more than that at the time. I don't know. It was we're talking about like nineteen ninety nine money. But anyway, mm-hmm. they would brag about having this accurate um, blue color, and even going to LEDs when you have this zoomed in um, look at all these little LEDs, you have these very fine pixels in red and green, but even those blue pixels are still kind of fuzzy and hazy. So what is it about blue, not just in the physical world with the paint, um, but also these blue LEDs and blue um, light projections that are so hard to um, create compared to red and green? So this gives me a opportunity to use this slide again. So um, here's the thing. The gap between this state and this state corresponds to that wavelength. Um, Red light uh, is long wavelength. Um, That's about 800 nanometers. Um, And it turns out that energy and wavelength are inversely proportional so that um, the longer your wavelength, um, right? So the longer the wavelength, the less energy there is there. So for red light, it's the lowest energy of the visible light. Green light is more energetic. Blue light's really energetic. It turned out for a long time that the materials that we could make LEDs out of had like a place that had electrons in, had a place where electrons could go. And we could manipulate like within a little bit, the levels that these um, places, these, these, uh, we'll call them bands had. We could manipulate the gap. We could only get it so far with existing materials for a long, long time. Um, Easy to make red, easy to make green, but green was kind of maxing out. We had to invent whole new materials that would get us band gaps that would um, give us um, blue light that was decent, right? So um, it's not only the band gap, but the um, material also has to be a light emitting um, substance, right? So yeah, it was a challenge getting the wavelengths shorter and shorter so that the energies would um, get bigger and bigger. So long wavelengths have low energies, right? So that's a very long distance, low energy, but short wavelengths have very high energies. Blue is a high energy and it just took us a long time to figure out materials that could give us uh, good blue lights. I think we're there though. I think, I think we got decent blue uh, at this point for LEDs. Um, probably more, probably more work can be done though. Well, yeah, I would imagine just all the different technologies we've got. But you know, when it comes to something like when you're looking at OLED, I think that's as you know they they talk about color accuracy and um, you know contrast accuracy. I think that's as good as we're, we are right now. But um, yeah, it's interesting when you brought up the fact that we're all looking at this presentation on um, you know LED screens, and you know it's such a hard. Um, Thing to get a hold of to find a color accurate device where you know there's very few monitors at pretty high price points that someone doing like some very professional photo photo editing photo creation whatever would that would accept um something as being color accurate um so i can definitely tell you this this laptop i'm on is probably highly inaccurate um and lots of people have at their homes kind of you know, TN panel gaming monitors or whatever it is that just, the, the concern is not color accuracy. The concern is like refresh rate for most mm-hmm. of those things. Um, so yeah, you're paying Boku bucks for, for color accuracy. Um, but even in, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like 
not being respectful of your time, but I was just going to say, even now when we're getting good. More, more and more, um, you know, higher and higher bit rate on the colors, like the, the recent 4K HDR technology has like 10 bit color that you can use. It's almost to the point where you watch some of these um, HDR films and it's like, is this accurate or is this too bold? These colors are too red. I can't imagine if you went on set to this film that the red would have looked that red. It's like we're kind of, and, I, and even on what would probably would be a, a color calibrated set, it seems like these are just, they're really pushing a lot of bloom on these things just, just to, I don't know, just to pop, catch attention to your eyes or, or what? Um. Well, one of the things, one of the things about your brain is that it can adapt to weird color palettes. Um, so um, there's, there's interesting kind of psychological experiments that I remember from, like when I was an undergraduate shortly after the uh, uh, glaciers receded from North America, right? Um, that uh, kind of showed um, LED projectors. Uh, and, you know, you showed a picture using one projector, and then you showed a project picture that was um, using a different projector that had been messed with. Uh, but it, if you were sitting in a dark room, you couldn't tell the difference. Uh, simply because, like, say the, say the um, say the image is too yellow. Your brain kind of compensated for that and it's like, well, okay, now the thing is too yellow, but all of the other colors are yellow in proportion and bam, now I'm seeing it as a true representation of what I would see it just out in uh, the sunlight, right? Your brain tries to process away um, some of the, some of the, um, um, inaccuracies in uh, colors that you see. So, you know, it may not be important to have like really ultra accurate, um, uh, you know, physically accurate monitors if your brain can just fill in the gaps and uh, give you the experience of accuracy. If that makes any sense. Yeah, well, it seems sometimes that the brain wants to see some of those more bold. It's kind of like the brain wants all the sugar and the fat. Like the brain wants the, the bolder color versus the muted, realistic color. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I have the perfect example of this. There's uh, So on YouTube, I saw some footage. I think it's from the 1940s, maybe early 1950s. It's the army disposing of sodium. And I'm talking truckloads of sodium, like hundreds of tons of this stuff. Sodium explodes when you um, when it hits water, and they were dumping this stuff off of a cliff into an alkaline lake, right? And you could see the detonations. Now, as a chemist, when I saw it and then described it to people later, I said, yeah, you could see the yellow of the sodium flare. And it's like, but then I look at it again, it's like, this wasn't color, this was black and white. My brain is putting in sodium light into um, these explosions. Um, and mind you, they, they, they were very impressive. Uh, um, don't try that at home. Of course, if you have a home built of sodium, I hope it doesn't rain. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to look for that. I'm kind of curious what, what that yeah. looks like. Um, well, I don't. I don't have any other questions that would I would call on topic. I guess maybe something I'll ask you if you care to um, uh, humor me is: so summer reading is in full swing. Uh, it ends on July 31st. Um, have you read anything good or even even um, something uh, totally different from science fiction wise or do you have any nonfiction science books that you'd recommend to some of my more layman viewers like myself or even someone a little more so, academic? Oliver Sacks. Anything by Oliver Sacks is wonderful, right? Um, so if you're interested in chemistry, Oliver Sacks has a, a book called Uncle Tungsten. Uh, that describes his early life experiences, like when he was, um, you know, teenager. Um, 
um, and his early life love of chemistry. And those were in the days when you could go like to your local pharmacy and buy a bottle of sodium, uh, which, which just blows me away. Um, and he also has, uh, also has some books on uh, perception. Um, so uh, for example, uh, he has a book called Island of the Colorblind, uh, which describes a um, journey he took to um, an island uh, where uh, the population has a, um, a lot of colorblind people because of um, you know, being isolated for, for, for a long time. And, you know, basically uh, talks about those experiences. Um, he has one on hallucinations, uh, and that that one is wonderful. Um, not only uh, well, he talks a little bit about drug-based hallucinations, but he also talks about um, um, just things that anyone can experience. Um, you know, both through the process of getting older, um, or um, you know, just from uh, being, uh, you know, being um, in some altered state at some point. So, yeah, Oliver Sacks books, uh, very good reads. Yes, great recommendation. We have audio books on CD, and we have the regular books, um, regular the print books. But yeah, we um, ever since I started working here. I, you know, people were telling me about the man who mistook his wife for a hat. And then, yep. you know, there's musicophilia. And the, the, the memoir, I guess, came out in 2017 or whatever, whenever. And then just this past year, I don't know if we have it, but we probably should get it. Um, there is a documentary on his life that came out to DVD, Blu-ray. So, yeah, those are all great. Uh, yes, I need to catch up on away. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I need to catch up on a lot of those. And they're all just, you know, quite different. Um He's definitely, uh, I don't know if I properly use the word Renaissance man, but he did a lot. He, he was a uh, crazy power lifter too. I mean, if you see that guy yeah. in his thirties, like that guy was a, was a, uh, yeah. I don't know what, what, what a PC, um, I was going to say brick blank house, but um, just a real um, comic book type physique. Um, so yeah, that guy is, he's, he's all over the place. Um, so great recommendation um all right well I'm, I'm assuming you have a lot of real research and, and um uh, academic reading that kind of keeps you from doing all of all of the fun uh fiction reading you'd like to do but oh you know, and there's always there's always the sandman from neil gaiman and um oh right yeah i just read um, about um their casting i don't remember where it's gonna go but yeah i don't know if it's a tv show or a movie but um i think it's gonna be an i think Thought it was going to be a Netflix series, but don't quote okay. me on that. Yeah, there's so many streaming sources now. Yeah, but yeah another yeah. great make recommendation. All righty. Well, I have people kind of popping in and viewing us, but uh, no other questions. I feel like I could okay. ask you a bunch of stuff, but like I said, I want to be respectful of your time. Um, and yeah, then I appreciate that. We Thank will you. have to, you know, continue the conversation on it. You know, pick a different topic or expand on on this sometime in the future so sure well i've got my nuclear medicine talk yeah. uh all ready to go um whenever we want to uh have uh have another one of these sessions and uh um, i've got some other talks actually ready to go too so sure thing um, yeah happy to be here all right well thank you very much and we you know i'm all for zoom talks but i, I know that sometime uh, as soon as this renovation that we have is over, we'll start to do some more um, in-person stuff. So maybe we could do both, do a Zoom in the meantime, and then winter or next spring, we can... Sure. Yeah. An in well, if you want to. An in-person talk would be wonderful. And, uh, you know, there's no reason why we can't uh, stream an in-person talk, too. We could figure it out. I might have to get this, the city, it out. city IT guy to come help me. We, 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 it can be done. It can um, be done. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you everyone for watching and then um, I'll catch you next time. All right. Thanks, Jacob. Right. I'm going to yeah. stop the sharing so we can wave and All right. uh, perfect. Take care. Go take some pictures of some cats and make sure you pet and feed your cats. Yeah. Yes. All right. Yes. Take care. Thank you. Take uh -huh. care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.